In this edition, we've got some fantastic layouts to share with you, including some that have been in operation for decades. As for prototypes, we'll take you to some absolutely amazing railroad destinations and explore great equipment from the past and present. And of course, we all strive to add realism and detail to our layouts, so we'll share some secrets and techniques that will help you make your operation look more authentic. And when you see this graphic, pay attention because it tells you the name of a computer file stored on this DVD, including additional details and techniques for creating and improving your layout. Let's get rolling as we bring the action, power, and creativity of model railroading to life in the Dream, Plan, Build video series. Jack Parker owns and operates Central Valley Models, one of the most respected names in model railroad accessories. He builds for others, but he also builds for himself. In the same building where he manufactures the add-ons that make your model railroad an attention getter, Jack Parker has been building his own dream. It is giant, 17 feet wide and more than 50 feet long. It's a model of the Northern Pacific near Logan, Montana circa 1950s. This HO layout is a scaled down version of the real thing. I grew up in Montana on the Northern Pacific in a town on the Northern Pacific and uh, I just didn't know any other railroad. I uh, worked for the Northern Pacific as a college student and uh, in the summertime and uh, then later learned that uh, the Northern Pacific was uh, in the 1950s, probably one of the most exciting railroads in North America. It was one of the last to abandon steam, and uh, steam locomotives are uh, one of my passions. And the Northern, Northern Pacific had a magnificent yeah, yeah, a nice roster of uh, steam locomotives in the 40s and 50s as I was growing up, and uh, well, this enables me to relive those wonderful times. So what you're looking at here is a model version of this man's memories, and what you're looking at here is one very interesting gentleman. Combat photographer during the Korean conflict, mechanical engineer, one-time designer for Revell, the famous model train kit firm. He describes his layout as a model of a railroad rather than just a model railroad. I'm so dedicated to modeling the Northern Pacific, I, I feel that uh, the uh, personality of the Northern Pacific probably overpowers the fact that it's a model. Well, this scenery represents uh, some of the semi-arid uh, scenery around Logan, Montana. Uh, it's not literal, but uh, it's influenced by the actual uh, scenery around Logan, Montana, which is uh, an important uh, division point on the Northern Pacific. It's uh, where the main line divides, and one line goes to Helena, Montana, and the other goes to uh, Butte, Montana. By doing semi-arid uh, scenery, it uh, I don't have to make so many trees. <laughs> we can uh, avoid quite so many of those uh, tedious little tasks. You'll, you'll notice that some of the scenery uh, is quite away from the edge of the bench work. And uh, so in order to, you know, in case there is I think it's the oper operating, operating problems, uh, in order to reach some of those uh, areas of the layout that are beyond arm's reach, why we've had to design in and construct uh, removable panels or movable scenery. This entire railroad is built uh, on what most model railroads consider uh, very uh, heavy lumber. I found it was easier to uh, use uh, heavier lumber like two by fours and, and uh, four by fours and uh, then to try to uh, construct the bench work out of the uh, lighter one inch material that uh, is so commonly used in model railroads. It, overall, uh, it took less linear footage of lumber to get a given uh, stiffness or rigidity in the bench work. The bench work is very stout and uh, um, very com uh, you can crawl up on top of it. It isn't going to, people can lean on it and so forth without any danger of uh, something collapsing. Because Jack models that period when the strength of steam was aging and giving way to diesel, he goes to great lengths to make sure this layout pulls you back in time. He has the mechanical aptitude to design an impressive layout, the artistic ability needed to build it.
and the heart to share it with others. Now we're ready to wire the layout for digital command control, or DCC. We've taken it off its legs and stood it up so that you can see the wiring on the bottom. What we have here are the feeder wires that were dropped through from the track. They're color-coded, and we know that the white wire goes to the outside rail and the blue wire goes to the inside rail, and that will allow us to make consistent connections without having to look at the track. We're going to use these heavy 16-gauge wires as a power bus to connect our feeders to the DCC command station. I have the power bus wires connected to this terminal block that has phono jacks where we can plug the command station in so we'll be able to separate it from the layout. We'll do all the wiring on the bottom of the layout first and then we'll be able to turn it up and plug in our command station and other controls. I'm going to use a cable tacker, which is a special kind of stapler, to tack our bus cable to the bottom of the layout, keep it out of the way. We're going to use Scotchlock insulation displacement connectors, also known as suitcase connectors, to connect the track feeders to the power bus on the layout. These make fast connections without soldering and they'll be completely insulated. The connector has an open side that a wire can slip into. So the bus wire that's already in place can go in there. We'll snap the little side up there to keep it in place. There's a hole for another wire to go in. And then the little metal part, which is called a knife, has to be squeezed down on the two wires to make the connection. There's an expensive tool sold specifically for these connectors. But there's also a cheap robo-grip plier you could get from a hardware store that'll do the job just fine. We want to squeeze that knife down in so it's flush with the top of the connector. And then we snap the lid closed. That's why it's called a suitcase connector. We have a solid connection that's completely enclosed. You'll notice as I've been making these connections, I've shortened the track feeder wires. I've cut off the excess wire so the run from the track feeder to the power bus is as short as possible. We want as much of our wiring run as possible to be in the heavier wires of the power bus. That prevents voltage loss and signal loss. We're going to install a cab bus, which in the Digitrack system which we're using is known as the locum net, so that we can use walk-around controllers on our layout. We have two types of panels to install. This one is for the standard tethered throttle throttle will be plugged into this unit and you'll hold it on the end of a wire and then this will be wired to the command station. The other one that we'll install is for a wireless throttle. This is a, actually a radio receiver. It has the electronics included on the back of it here. With this one, you will need to plug the cab in to set up a locomotive assignment, but then you'll be able to disconnect from the layout and just walk around freely without any physical connection. We'll install this one on this side of the layout, and this one will go on the other side. I'm going to cut a hole in the side right here so that we can install the panel for the wireless unit. I'm going to drill four holes here. our plug panel fits right in there and we'll secure it with four screws. The power bus that we installed before connecting to the feeders would be the same in any kind of DCC system. But when we get to the cab bus, the loco net in the Digitrack system, that's specific for the system. It uses these telephone style connectors. We'll connect the two plug panels that we installed. Then we have another cable that connects to the same plug panel and runs through a hole we've drilled over here, and this will connect to our command station. Speaking of the command station, we're going to need a power supply for that and also for the radio plug panel. And that's why we've added this power strip to the layout, and we've got these cable ties on it to secure the power supplies once they're plugged in. Now we're ready to install our DCC command station. We're using the Digitrack Zephyr, which is a unit made for small model railroads. 
It has a number of features. It has a set of speed and direction controls. It has a keypad that you use for several things. It, it selects locomotives, controls functions, and it also allows you to program decoders. And there'll be an LED readout activated when it's plugged in. This unit also has a feature that Digitrust called the calls the jump connection. The two terminals on the uh, far ends and the ground connection here can be used to connect DC power packs to use as additional speed controls. We're not going to use that on this layout, but if you have an extra uh, DC power pack, you don't have to get rid of it just because you're into DCC. You can use it as a speed controller with the Digitrax Zephyr. The connections we're concerned with here, these two on the end, are the rail connections. That's where we connect our red and black power bus wires that we were working with before. The power supply plugs in here. That was the big black transformer that we plugged into the power strip. And then the loco net, the uh, cab bus, plugs into this telephone connector here. And here are the wires we'll be connecting. This is the red and black wire from our power bus. This is the plug from our power supply. And this is the cable for the loco net. So those are the connections. And now we're going to put some Velcro strips onto the bottom of the command station and onto our little shelf here to hold it securely. And then just press this down snugly. Now we've plugged in our power strip under the layout, and we have power to the Zephyr command station. We see the loco display, which shows that it's getting power, but we have to push the power button here to turn on the track status light. That means we have power on the track now. I press the loco button, and I can assign the locomotive by punching in its number and hitting the loco button again. When the number goes steady, that means I have the engine and I should be able to run it. Now we'll look at the two walk-around throttles we have for our Digitrax DCC system. The first is this UT4. This is the tethered throttle that has to be plugged into the layout to operate. The knobs here, thumb wheel knobs, are used to set the locomotive number. So I've got my 907 locomotive number, and then I just plug it in, and I've automatically acquired that locomotive. I set the direction switch, and it's in operation. Notice you can unplug that cab, the locomotive continues running. The other cab we have is the Digitrax wireless walk-around cab, the UT4R. You say wireless, it does have to be plugged into the layout to acquire the locomotive after you set the locomotive number on the dials just as with the other throttle. When it's plugged in and the locomotive is acquired, the green light comes on, you can unplug and operate your locomotive without being connected to the layout. Now that we have our DCC system working, we can operate the railroad just the way it was intended, with independent control for both the New York Central and the Baltimore and Ohio lines. The engineers don't have to worry about the electrical circuits, the digital signals take care of that. They have to watch out for other trains though, just like on the real railroads. If there's such a thing as a museum where the past comes alive, you're looking at it right now. Steamtown National Historic Park in Scranton, Pennsylvania. In a way, it's kind of like a factory because this is a place where memories are made. Spread out over more than 60 acres in downtown Scranton, this is a place that pulls you into yesteryear to tell you the story about steam. I'd describe Steamtown for a new visitor as a place uh, really for the general public and not necessarily for the rail fan, meaning that anybody can come to this place and learn a lot about the history of American railroading and how much railroading played a role in our American history. Steamtown had been 10 years in the making when it opened in 1995, and in its first year attracted more than 200,000 visitors. You don't have to look far to see why. 
The pure power and prestige of the steam is impressive in itself. But behind those clouds of steam, you find the story of this country's industrial revolution. Well, the steam railroad was one of those uh, really amazing uh, engines of change, if you will, in our story, in our American story. It uh, brought most of the immigrants who came to the Middle West and the Far West into this country to settle. It uh, was part of the Industrial Revolution. It really connected all the rest of the Industrial Revolution together. And in that way, the railroad became that unique business that interconnected every other business. It was the veins and arteries of the American economy. And while it connected up the economy, it also connected up our social fabric. Uh, people could live in small towns and out on farms and be connected to the rest of the world. They could get their mail in the newspapers. They could order packages from Sears and Roebuck and Montgomery Ward, get the mail every day. Uh, it was the way we became a nation on wheels, was really in the 19th century with the steam railroad. And then with the coming of the, well, the automobile, like the Model T, and better highways and trucks, uh, pretty soon the railroads began losing some of their freight business and some of their passenger business. And that whole process really escalated after World War II. Uh, during the war, the railroads hauled again 80, 90 percent of everything that moved because there was gas rationing and rubber tire rationing and uh, moving all the uh, war material to the ports. But after World War II, the bottom fell out. Uh, traffic went in the tank as uh, the highways and the trucks really took away the, the, the goods and the people. Airlines began, began to be a real factor in the late 50s and early 60s. And uh, pretty soon uh, the passenger business was gone and just struggling. Uh, Amtrak was created in 1971 to basically save the American passenger train. And many railroads uh, with their remaining freight business uh, went bankrupt. Leo McLean, now in his 70s, might just be one of Steamtown's most knowledgeable employees and certainly one of the most colorful. He worked this railroad line long before it was a museum. Because I like railroading, it's it got in the end of my blood, and uh, you can't get it out. I don't care what you do. And I, I still come over here, uh, even in the winter time when I'm laid off, I, I still come over here and visit and walk around and see what the new developments they have. It's tough to say what you will be most impressed with here. It might be the nearly 30 steam locomotives or the nearly 90 freight and passenger cars. It might be the reconstructed Delaware Lackawanna and Western Railroad Roundhouse and Yard. Yes, it's a working roundhouse with an elevated walkway so you can get a bird's eye view. 200,000 square feet, which also house two museums and the story of the evolution of the steam railroad. But one thing that is sure to take your breath away is the excursion ride on a working steam train. All aboard! You're not simply looking at history. You're living it as the train rolls along 13 miles of restored Lackawanna Main Line. Combine the beauty of the train with the majesty of the Poconos, and it's a breathtaking sight you will not soon forget. Moving your entire model train layout 500 miles to a new home can present some challenges. Here's how Darrell Cruz made the transition when he was uprooted from Missouri to Illinois. When I built the layout in Missouri, I built it uh, with the idea that at some point in time I would probably have to move it. Uh, it wasn't a module type of thing because I had plaster over the whole thing and the tracks ran from one section to the next. But I was able to unbolt the sections um, and then with all the cars and structures off, of course, I then took my uh, Dremel tool and just cut through the plaster and was able to get the the layout into four somewhat manageable pieces. Darrell had much more space in the new house for his train room, but first he had to finish the basement. Luckily, his new town became a major source of inspiration. Rochelle, Illinois has an active Union Pacific main line that crosses the Burlington Northern Santa Fe line. It's one of the best train watching spots in the Midwest. Rail fans from all over the country come to Railroad Park to sight trains under a covered pavilion. Darrell's original Union Pacific layout depicted the line from Pleasant Hill, Missouri to Bonner Springs, Kansas, a line that ran just a few miles from his former home. He decided to model a new portion of his layout on his new hometown, but the new basement presented a few difficulties. There was a bay window here, which of course uh, was a little bit uh, tough to decide what to do with it. I also had this 12-foot piece that I moved here from Missouri, 
and that was the hardest piece to fit in this room because it was the longest. Uh, but then uh, when I figured out that this would kind of nestle nicely with the, uh, the bay window, um, it kind of set where everything else went and it worked out pretty nice. And then uh, I've always wanted a nice long high bridge because uh, I wanted it to, to still look mid Midwestern. I didn't want any you know, steep cliffs and so forth, so I wanted something to be more, more gentle. Uh, rolling and, and the bay window kind of you know worked out pretty nice I think. Using micro engineering kits Daryl now has a nine span four tower bridge. The old layout is complete and he still has plenty of room to work on the Rochelle scene. Rochelle is a beautiful place and a beautiful town and lots of trains but as far as scenery goes there's not a whole lot uh, around the, the town except for cornfields and uh, I have nothing against cornfields but it's not the most exciting thing to model. Uh, I do plan on having some cornfields on the layout, but I didn't want to have, you know, a layout with just cornfield after cornfield. So um, instead of trying to model the entire, you know, northern part of the state here, um, I basically am planning on concentrating on modeling Rochelle as much as possible and as closely as possible. The rest of the part, I, the rest of the layout, I'm pretty much uh, freelancing and trying to make it just uh, generic mid Midwestern. The staging yard is tucked into the furnace room and is filled with some very sharp turns. Quite an accomplishment when you consider that Daryl wanted to run seven tracks, some with lines of up to 40 cars. The curvature had to go down to 13 inches, which I was a little concerned about, but I was, uh, I think, somewhat uh, made confident by the fact that all my couplers are body mounted, uh, which handles uh, curves a lot better than truck mounted. Um, a lot of the end scale cars come with a couplers mounted on the trucks, which is fine, but if you're going around a lot of sharp curves, it can uh, cause some problems. Um, and the body mounted couplers have really helped, and um, for the most part, there haven't been uh, too much trouble getting the trains in and out of the staging yards, um, as long as they don't try and back it up all the way through the staging yards. One of Daryl's other hobbies is computers. So it's no surprise that he had fun creating the layout wiring and a computer interface for the signaling systems. His new layout features a Digitrax Digital Command Control Center, which was added to his original electrical blocks. You don't have to mess with the, the flipping of the blocks and so forth. You can just concentrate on running the uh, trains. The marriage of Daryl's two passions, engaged train operations and computer programming, helped him create impressive signaling with a centralized traffic control system. Uh, as the trains go throughout the layout, the computer knows where the trains are and it sets the, uh, the signal indications according to where the train is and it just throws the signals as needed uh, depending on where the uh, trains are and, and where uh, one train is going from one place to, to the next. Uh, when we have a group uh, come in and operate, I can uh, change the uh, setup to the dispatcher setup and uh, with this setup I'm here at the computer while the trains are being operated by the crews. I can again set the route for that train to come out of the staging yards. Then when it stops, the uh, crews have to you know, call me for further clearance. There's a timetable sheet for each train with information about the trains. The computer shows the track layout and small sections of the tracks light up when trains are present, just like in a real operation. The operators watch the signals, and there's usually a yardmaster in the town of Nelson. They can run about 15 trains at once. Daryl hopes to expand his layout into the entire basement someday. In the meantime, he enjoys bringing the sights and sounds of Railroad Park to life in his own home. Car cards and waybills are a system for directing the movement of freight cars on a model railroad. Their purpose is to simulate the movement of freight. We want to represent the business of the railroad in transporting cargo around the country. This involves getting empty cars to shippers to be loaded, taking the loaded cars to the consignees, and then moving the empties back to be reloaded. On the rail railroad, this involves a lot of paperwork. That means a lot of clerical workers or computers. But for model railroads, we want to simplify this into something that's easy to use and that's what this is all about. The system has three parts. There's a car card for every car and it identifies a specific car. We'll look in more detail at that but notice that it has a pocket to hold the waybill. The waybill 
tells where the car is going, and that slips into the pocket. So these together move around the railroad with the car. You can see that if you have one of these car cards for every car on your layout, plus a bunch of waybills, you're going to have a lot of these things to keep track of. So we use a simple file box like this with pockets to hold the cards, and each one of these pockets can hold a stack uh, big enough for a train usually. The boxes and the printed forms for the cards and the waybills are all available by mail order, so you can do the whole thing with off-the-shelf items. We have the, the type of car, tank car, where it says AAR, that's the Association of American Railroads Car Classification. Uh, you don't necessarily have to bother with this, but it's a, uh, a system that the real railroads use, so a lot of people like to do that. For this tank car, it would be a type TM. Then railroad and number is what we call the reporting marks that identify the car. And that's what you see on the side of the car right here. So this information comes right off your cars. So you have UTLX 77496. UTLX is the Union Tank Car Line, a tank car leasing company. For description, uh, you can use this line for basically anything you want. You could just write in black so people would know that that was a black tank car. I've written in ICC 103 because, again, from the uh, small data on the end of the car, that's a, an identifying type for this tank car. Where it says empty car, return to, I haven't filled this one out, but you can put information in there for where you want a, a car to go back. A tank car like this, uh, the Union Tank Line actually leases these cars out for shipment, so it doesn't always go back the same place, so you wouldn't want to fill this out for a tank car. However, Here's an example with a flat car, uh, a Great Northern flat car, and we say here, return to agent GN Railway, Bieber, California, uh, which was the uh, interchange connection that this car came from. So that's the, uh, the way the car would get routed back. Make one of these for each car. I like to do that with the cars in front of me so I can take the information right off the car itself. So if we took this Baltimore and Ohio hopper car, Kind is a hopper. The AAR class is HM. The railroad, B and O for Baltimore and Ohio. And the number, 733147. And description, in this case, we'll say 50 ton. And again, that comes from the classification. This uh, empty uh, car return to, uh, since this is a car that would be used in coal service, um, we'll say something like return to b &O agent Kaiser, West Virginia, which is down in the coal country where uh, the b &O carried a lot of coal. A couple of references that are handy when doing work like this. This is a copy of the official register of railway equipment. Now this is a book that's published for the use of railroads and it identifies all the cars that are in service in the country. This is a reproduction that was published by the National Model Railroad Association uh, dated January 1953. So it's right in the uh, period of the model railroad that we're working on, the Black River Junction. And this book, besides listing all the cars, has the information like the AAR uh, car types that I was mentioning. It also lists the interchange points for each railroad so you can see where your railroad might connect with another railroad. And that's all useful information in uh, filling out these forms. It's also handy to have maps so you know where the railroads go. Uh, this is a, uh, an atlas uh, that has uh, state maps uh, showing all the railroads in each state. Um, and you can also use uh, railroad system maps for the particular railroad that you want to model. Um, that information is, is helpful in uh, keeping things logical. You want to know where your railroad is located in the world. We're saying our Black River Junction layout is in northern Ohio. And then you can understand where cars from other railroads would have to go in order to, uh, to get to your railroad and where you want to send them back to. A car's number is its unique identification. 
So if you wanted to have a fleet of cars like these B&O hoppers, you want to make sure that each one had its own individual number. Some manufacturers sell cars in groups where you get the same type of car with maybe 12 different numbers. Others sell cars without numbers so that you can apply the numbers with decals. And if you paint your own cars and letter them with decals, you want to make sure that you put a distinctive number on each car. That way you won't have any confusion on the railroad as to which car is which. Okay, the next part of the system is the waybill that goes into the pocket to tell us where the car is going to go. The waybill forms come on a pad and they have four steps. And the way they fit into the pockets, only one of these steps will be showing at any time. So you can have the car routed to four different locations, destinations, in a sequence. You don't have to use all those steps though. For example, the waybill I have here is for this great northern flat car with a lumber load. It says we have a load of 4x8 lumber going to a lumber yard in San Bernardino, California. When we deliver it to that destination on the layout or send it off to a staging yard going in that direction, we can pull this waybill out of the pocket and then file it for later use. And then we would have an empty car with directions on how to get it back. So that's why we filled out that information on the car card. And by the way, if you make the load removable, you can really have an empty car. We'll fill out a waybill for our B&O hopper car that we looked at before. The information doesn't all have to be filled out. You only need to put in what you want. We have a factory on our layout that we haven't named yet, so we can just write in factory. It's the only one. It won't be a problem. The address line would be Black River Junction. We'll just write BRJ to save space. And we'll say the routing is B and O NYC, Baltimore and Ohio to New York Central, because the factory is actually on the New York Central part of our layout. So this car has to be interchanged to the New York Central. And in the VIA line, we'll just write New York Central INT for interchange. Now there's information here for the, uh, the shipper and address. We don't really have to care about that. It's a load of coal. Uh, it came out of the ground. Uh, but we'll write in coal so we have the lading. And that way, Bill, can slip into our pocket, and this car is ready to go for our first operating session. And you only have to fill out one of these steps to get started in operation. You can always leave these things empty. Uh, use them, as I showed before, by just pulling them out and sending the car back on that direction, or you can fill out as many of these steps as you want to. The last part of our system are the file boxes that we looked at before. The cards go right in there. There are different ways of organizing your cards in the, in the file boxes. One popular way would be to label them, set out, hold, and pick up. The sequence of operation with this system would be when you deliver a car in this town, and each town would have a box like this, the car being delivered you put into the set out box. The next time a train comes to town to do some switching work, that train crew would move that card to the hold box, and any new cars that they deliver, the cards would be left in the set out box. Then the third time through, another train comes, the card in the hold box moves to pick up, the card in set out moves to hold, and any new cars being set out go into the set out box. Then the train picks up the cars that are in the pick up box and takes those away. Some people prefer a different system. And that would be to label each box for a particular industry or industry spot. So here I have the foundry, the freight house, and the interchange track that we have on our Black River Junction layout. So here, if you have a car, let's see, in the box, and the waybill says anything different than the the label on that box, 
then you would pick this car up and take it away. If it has a label that matches the box, then it's being held there. And the way this works is that you, as the owner of the layout, would set these cards up before the operating session. You would turn the waybills when they needed to be turned or pull them out of the boxes. And so your friends operating the layout wouldn't have to worry about things like that. They would be able to see what's going on just by pulling things out. Now, I'm using these tall cards to label the boxes. And this is a good way for you to try out a, one or the other system and see what you like. Once you decide how you want the boxes labeled, most people like to label them permanently, as I've done here on these boxes for a freight yard. And you see I've labeled drill, this would be the switching lead, and the cards in this box would be the ones you're actually working. And then for the numbered tracks, as you sort the cards out, they would go into track one, two, three, or four. And then this last box is labeled ice for the ice house, where you would load ice into refrigerator cars. For a freight yard, numbered tracks are really the only way to go because the cars are not actually at destinations here, they're moving on to somewhere else. But the idea of where you put the labels on the boxes would be the same thing if you were permanently labeling a town box. You can see that however you want to organize the system, car cards and waybills are a really flexible way to manage your freight cars on your railroad, and they give realistic purpose to your operations. Like most people who are into this pleasurable addiction we call model railroading, Rob Spangler spends an awful lot of time in his basement. Well, with work and everything else in our modern life, it gets to be so stressful. It's nice to have something to uh, come home to, to uh, exercise your creativity and to uh, get some relaxation and uh, do a lot of the things that you just don't get to do when you're on your job. Rob has been into model railroading since he was about eight years old. A mere 20 years later, this young man has put together a layout that would be the envy of any enthusiast. He's built the Northern Nevada Railway. It's a fictitious extension and wholly owned subsidiary of the real Western Pacific Railroad. It runs from Southern Idaho through Northern Nevada. The time period, late 1970s, early 1980s. Rob has recreated the visual feel of the railroad as the trains roll through a sparsely populated and seldom modeled region. Realism was his main desire. Mission accomplished. On top of the strength and scenery base, I start applying plaster with a fairly large tool like this uh, old drywall knife and do very little basic shaping at this stage. Just get the plaster troweled onto the the cut area based on the initial plan that I had for what the basic shape of it would be and then I start refining it with several other tools. I can use a putty knife and a lot of the larger vertical cuts through this plaster are done with a putty knife and it will break out plaster around the knife. You can see around the knife here there's a fairly large area that was broken out and that will create natural looking broken strata. And another tool that is extremely helpful is an artist's palette knife, something like this, costs only about a dollar. And it can be used also to bring more strata lines out and it will cause smaller amounts of plaster to break out because it's a smaller, sharper edge. And as the plaster gets harder, we can switch to different tools. Some of the final carving is done with something like this wood chisel. I started the uh, room construction by preparing the room as you would any other room in your house with uh, normal studs and drywall construction. Uh, down the center of the room, this backdrop, we did something a little different because this area of the railroad is very narrow and we didn't want operators kicking uh, benchwork supports under here. We built a stud wall and attached it to the ceiling and our supporting the railroad actually off of the ceiling. That's why there are no legs under this area. Okay. On this Western Pacific boxcar, there was no kit available that had this paint scheme represented accurately. But I did have a photograph of a similar car that I took in Salt Lake. And it allowed me to locate all of the decals properly. I did have to modify the doors slightly. There were a couple of castings in this area on the door that were not there on the prototype. 
And so I removed the pieces of plastic there. I also replaced the grab irons on the corners, added some grab irons on the ends, and then painted and decaled the car to match its prototype. To make uh, trees like bo box elders and cottonwoods that are common along the uh, river courses in the west, I start with uh, natural materials. I go out to the canyons of the Wasatch or the salt flats and start grabbing dead bushes. To add a foundation for the uh, leaves to finish the tree, I use this uh, polyfiber from Woodland Scenics and stretch it out as much as possible so that the tree has a see-through effect and start draping this stuff around the branches. For adhesive, I use uh, thick, yucky hairspray from the uh, cheapest bottle I can get at the grocery store and start attaching various grades of ground foam. Want to saturate an area pretty good with the hairspray because any place where the hairspray isn't, the foam won't stick. I begin with a fairly coarse grade of foam to give the tree some texture. And you can also turn the tree upside down and from uh, every angle attach foam to it so you don't have any of the uh, polyfiber showing through. For Rob Spangler, this is the perfect hobby for a young man, just as it was the perfect hobby for a kid, just as it will be the perfect hobby for an old man. Weathering is a name that we model railroaders use to refer to a variety of techniques that you can use to add a little extra realism to your locomotives, rolling stock, or structures. Today we're going to talk about adding some weathering with an airbrush. An airbrush is basically a very small paint spray gun. You'll use it to apply very light coats of paint over the existing paint and lettering on your locomotive or your car. Two basic things that are going on here. One is you're simulating the weathering, the dirt, the grime, the rust that comes from the locomotive or car itself. On a diesel or on a steam locomotive, of course, you have the exhaust, but you have all sorts of other things that might, you know, fuel that drips along the fuel tank, rust from paint chips, things like that. The other thing that you're doing is you're simulating the dirt and grime that come from the locomotive's environment. Locomotive in coal country, for example, might get really dark with black coal dust. A locomotive out west might have a much lighter color of dust from the desert. Something to consider as you choose what color of paint you'll be using is also the color of your train. For example, this Elko RS3 is a medium gray, New York Central passenger color. If I want to add some exhaust to that, I can use black. But if I were to use that same black on this steam locomotive, you wouldn't see it. You might use a medium gray or even a gray that's darker than this, something we modelers often call grimy black, on a steam locomotive. Similarly, the dirt color. Something from the east might use a color like that. Something running out west might use a color like that. Something running in a desert, you might even use a little dust color like this. One of the important things to consider as you get ready to use your airbrush to apply some weathering is what kind of paint you'll be using. And you want to match your thinner to your paint. For example, if you use an acrylic paint, a water-based paint, you'll want to use a solvent that's meant to be used with that paint. If you use an enamel, an organic paint, a solvent-based paint, you'll want to use a thinner that's appropriate for that. You don't ever want to mix them, however. If you use a thinner for, made for use with acrylics with an enamel, you'll have a problem, basically a plugged airbrush and the same if you do the opposite. I have a couple of different thinners with me here today, as you can see, but because I'm going to be using Tamiya paint, I'll use Tamiya thinner. And to help it go on just a little bit better, I'll add a few drops of what's called Flow Enhancer to each batch of paint that I mix up. All the Flow Enhancer does is help the paint break up into slightly smaller droplets so it'll go on a little more smoothly. Step one in getting ready to paint is to mix your paint. Now one thing I advise is that you never shake your paint. I know you'll see it done a lot, certainly at the hardware store when you buy a gallon of paint for uh, repainting your dining room or something, but what that does with a model paint is gets paint up on the lid where it'll dry. And then when you go to run it through your airbrush, little flakes of that dried paint will get in and plug the brush. 
So instead, I take a stick, usually I just use bamboo skewers that I buy at the grocery store, and mix the paint until when I pull the skewer out, I don't see any clumps of pigment on the bottom. So now I have my paint mixed, I have my airbrush. I'll put a little bit of thinner into the brush first. Not everyone does it this way. I like to. Of course, some brushes you actually use a bottle of paint that attaches to the bottom. This brush has what's called a color cup on top. So the paint and the thinner go in the top. I like a top loading brush because it allows me to use a little bit lower air pressure. You aren't having to draw the paint up from the bottle, so it's a little, you can go with a little bit less air. Add a little bit of flow enhancer, and then I'll just take an ordinary soda straw, plug the top with my finger, and drop a little paint in. You'll talk with some people, I'm sure, who will tell you that there are fixed ratios that you should be using when you mix your paint. And Honestly, I think that's a pretty great theory, but in reality, different paints, even from a different batch of paint, depending on how old it is, they'll all have different viscosities. And so you'll want to thin them differently based on the paint you're using. A good rule of thumb is to thin the paint until it has about the consistency of milk. Okay, now let's take our brush and put a little bit of exhaust smoke on the alco. I always like to start the air flowing before I pull back the knob and start any paint flowing. Alcos are known for their heavy exhaust, so around the exhaust stack here, I'll give it plenty of black. You see that I use just a few pieces of post-it note to mask the side windows so that I don't accidentally weather those also. Okay, so now I have my black on my Alco. What about my steam locomotive? Again, the black's not really going to help me. So what I will do for that is I'll add just a little bit of white to the mix. You don't need that much, but that will allow me to have my weathering be visible on the steam locomotive. And in a way, with the steam locomotive, what I'm going to be doing is adding everything but the exhaust. And what I'll probably come back and do later is put a, maybe I'll put a little bit of gloss uh, clear on here to simulate some water that splashed out of the hatch, and probably put a little gloss plaque on the coal. I don't want this look, locomotive to look like it's on its way to the scrapyard. So I'm being pretty light with the weathering, but I think I like what I have here. Now I'll come back to the Alco and use this dark gray on its running gear, which is black. And what I'll also do is spray a little gray on the sides. It's almost the same color as the body of the locomotive, and that'll have the effect of fading the lettering. You can also take passenger cars, or in this case an RDC, and weather them. Now generally they were pretty clean, so I don't go real heavy. I'll lighten the trucks a little on both sides. Then I'll come back and add a little dirt on the roof to simulate the exhaust. Then I come back with just a light overall coat after I've highlighted, or in this case darkened, the grills. Some guys like to mask things like grills or mask around them. I generally don't. Uh, depends on how comfortable you are trying to paint up to a line with your brush. Again, you're weathering so it doesn't have to be a sharp line and in fact it looks a little artificial. But you can do that if that makes you more comfortable. Or you can use what's called a soft mask, which is to just take a piece of paper, hold it a little bit of a distance away, and that will give you a line but not a real sharp one. Here are two more tips that I think you'll find useful. 
One is that you can take a car, or a locomotive for that matter, give it a light overspray of its base color. And what that does is it has the effect of fading the lettering, as if it's been in service, maybe not in a really dirty environment, but just like the paint starting to wear off a little. Let's take a look. Now, you're probably wondering, what if I make a mistake? Do I ruin my locomotive or my piece of rolling stock? Not necessarily. If I hit it with a little Windex, Now this trick doesn't work with every paint, so you'll want to test it first, but with many of the acrylics, window cleaner is actually a very effective paint remover even after the paint is dried. Now we have locomotives that are a little bit darker, a little bit shaded, but let's add a little bit of life to them now with some highlights. One area on a train that is never painted, it's uh, illegal to do so because it might just obscure a crack, a flaw, is the coupler a rusty brown color, which I think makes it look a lot more realistic. Now because our locomotives ran in the east, the dirt there is also pretty dark. So I will be able to use this color or one very, very close to it for my dirt also. But before I do that, I'll simulate a little bit of rust from stone chips. And I'll even put a little bit of rust on the trucks in a few spots. Now I'll come back with a brownish color and simulate some dirt along the lower half of each train. One thing that you can do, it's a little bit of a trick, is on the end of the locomotive or car, you can do some vertical streaks of dirt to simulate what's thrown up from the wheels. Doesn't take much. Now our diesel, our RDC, and our steam locomotive are ready to go in service on the layout. Many garden railroads are family projects, and that's certainly the case with Andy Delucia's Sierra Nevada Northern Railroad. This garden is special to the Delucia family because the Japanese bonsai trees here were gifts from Andy's father-in-law 30 years ago. He said that they need to be watered every 20 minutes, and I kind of laughed, <laughs> and he laughed with me. And he said, no, we're going to put them in the ground. And, but you have to be careful because a lot of these trees I'm giving you are 60 to 70 years old. Andy had a lifelong love of trains, but it was his son, Brian, who inspired the Garden Railroad. He was two years old. I got this size train, this G-scale train. We had it going around the Christmas tree. And then uh, as he got older, he said, Dad, why don't we go outside? And I said, yeah, sure. <laughs> so I put it out on the deck uh, first, and then eventually he said, no, 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 we would need to go in the garden. They started planning how to blend a new railroad with the 30-year-old garden back in 1999. We only live about 20 miles from the Gold Discovery site in Coloma, California here. As moving all this dirt around, which is a lot of it's decomposed granite, a lot of it's rock, a lot of it fell into the stream, and lo and behold, as I'm working on it, I see gold in there. And if you look really carefully, you'll probably still see gold floating around in there. Not enough to really do much, but uh, the railroad saw a profit on its first year. <laughs> The Sierra Nevada Northern Railroad's time frame is 1939, when this make-believe railroad was struggling to recover from the Great Depression by servicing gold and silver mines, lumber companies, and even cattle and sheep farms. In the south, at the lowest part of the layout, the railroad connects the town of Truckee and the Southern Pacific Main Line through the infamous Donner Pass. Then it climbs north to the Western Pacific and on to meet the old Nevada-California-Oregon Railroad. With Andy's background as a professional photographer, it's no surprise that he always kept an eye on how the trains and garden would look, much like he would if he were composing a photograph or a painting. It can take as long as six months to scratch build some of these detailed structures. Recent additions include a firehouse and a garage. And there's the A. Adams and Company, 
maker of fine cameras and lenses, a tribute to Ansel Adams, the father of nature photography. The wood that's used here on these buildings, it was originally used in the Southern Pacific trestle on the Sacramento Bypass, and that trestle was taken down in about 1920. That old wood that was taken out of there was put into homes in the Fair Oaks area of Sacramento, and just recently, about three years ago, that wood was torn out of those homes, and uh, my friend helped me cut it up on a table saw, and it became these buildings. The wood is knotless. It doesn't have any knots in it at all. And people who look at this wood in the large pieces of wood are just totally amazed how beautiful redwood is. A lot of this redwood here is from the original growth redwood trees in Northern California. Andy and his friend Jim Daly scratch built or kit bashed all of the structures to fit the railroad's theme. And there are lots of personal touches. The graffiti you see around the layout is family momentous occasions. Here on the water tower, I have my youngest son's graduation day. I've had my oldest daughter get married. You'll see that on other graffiti and the layout on the bridge, and you'll see some graffiti written on another water tower, etc. Andy and Jim also built all 10 bridges out of plastic or metal. All the oak trees here, there's quite a few. There's in this backyard, there's 12 that are within range of the railroad. And the oak trees are beautiful trees, but it can be kind of destructive because of their leaves. There's a lot of acid in their leaves. Other plants love them, but wood does not like it. While the oak trees are busy naturally distressing any wooden structures on the layout, Andy works hard to add man-made distressing techniques to his engines and rolling stock. Everything. Even the more modern diesel engines are airbrushed and detailed to look like they stepped right out of 1939. Those diesels come in handy when the trains make their way up the 3.5% grades into the mountains. I'm like Walt Disney, you know, like he said, Disneyland will never be finished. I'm kind of like that as well. The track is at the length it's going to be. I want to start doing some animation. All the buildings are going to be lit. Uh, right now I have about 90% of them lit. There are lights in the building, it's just a matter of wiring. Uh, just a lot of detail work yet to go. On this particular model railroad, we're going to take and put a river on each corner. And so I'll start by marking the location of the river right on top of the scenery using just a black marker. I'm actually going to draw the river a little more narrow then how the final river will appear because we're going to cut the banks of the foam away on a slope. So, looks pretty good for our starting point of the river. We don't want to get the river too close to the track uh, because uh, actual railroads wouldn't allow the, the river bank to get that close to their right of way uh, for fear of washing out the track. So, we've got a fairly good distance here. Next, I'm just going to take a, a regular utility knife and I'm going to cut through our foam scenery layer. I'm going to cut all the way down to the bottom of the, uh, the layout, and in this case our bench work is covered with plywood. And the plywood is going to form the base to our river. Just work the knife in, following my mark. Now that I've made the initial cut, next thing I'm going to do is take this vinyl scenery layer that we put down and peel it off. It should be easier to make the final cut I'm going to use this putty knife to take and make the last bit of cut in the foam. So now all that should be left is just pop this guy out. And there we go. River. Now that we've got the river section out, we're going to take and slope the banks down. You can use a number of different tools to do this. I'm going to use this old wallpapering knife. Uh, it's got a nice long blade, but I like it because the blade is curved as well, which makes cutting uh, slopes into curved pieces, uh, a fairly easy process. So I'll begin by starting on one side of the river, and I'm not going to take and make a complete cut into the slope. I'm going to take and make a partial cut first. This way, if I don't like what I've done, I can take and come back and change the, sh the slope later. Use the sanding block to get off all of these little rough nubs that come up on the foam when it tears. The bottom of the river, in this case, is plywood. 
We're going to use that as the base for our river. Uh, we'll paint it so that it has depth to it, and then we're going to cover it with a resin material that will take and make it look like it's wet. Uh, but before we can do that, we have to take and get rid of the plywood look. And so we have to fill in the wood grain itself. For that task, I'm using a um, lightweight spackling compound. This dries very quickly, and so it's easy to use. You can put on several layers within the course of an hour, sand it, and be ready to paint. Now that our spackling's dry, it's time to take and sand the riverbed. I'm using my sanding block again. We'll take up any of the high spots that are left by the spackling. The next step is to take and make our riverbanks, and for that we're going to use a product called sculpt mold This is basically a paper mache product that's got plaster mixed in with it. It's a lot neater and easier to work with than real plaster of Paris would be, uh, a common material used by most model railroaders. I like it a lot. After pouring some sculpt mold into a mixing container, in this case I have an old measuring cup, uh, I'll take and add some water to it, and then we'll take and mix it to it. It's about an oatmeal consistency before we apply it. Just take a small blob of it and we'll work it along the edge. Typical working time is about 10 to 15 minutes. We can take and add a little more erosion marks simply by taking the putty knife and making it a little flat along where it comes next to the river edge. Painting the river banks is going to be a multiple step process. We'll start by putting our latex scenery color on, which is a nice tan, and then we're going to take and add some Elmer's glue or just any white glue into it take and use my paintbrush to mix the two. And then we're going to take some limestone ballast. This is a fine grit ballast. Uh, this one happens to be made by Highball Products, but you could even use just a fine silica sand that you can get in any hardware store. Now that we've got our sandy ballast into the paint and the glue on the sides of the riverbank, we have to do one last step. The glue is there and the paint will hold the ballast okay, but we really want to set it. So to do that, I'm going to take and use my water and rubbing alcohol mixture again. I'm just going to spritz it lightly. The water will take and interact with the glue and the, the paint and get around the ballast and help seat it down so it doesn't go anywhere. The next step in the process is to paint the river bottom itself. We're going to use a dark paint, in this case flat black, in order to give the illusion of depth once we've poured the resin. The next step in our river process is to take and airbrush in the banks. This is going to take and feather in the sides into our black paint that we've already put down and make it look like the river has depth when we pour the resin over the top. The important thing is that you remove the sharp edge between the black and the tan. Finally, we get to add the water to the river. We've done all the painting work and so here we go. We're going to use realistic water. It's a product made by Woodland Scenics. It's a water-based resin. Start by pouring the resin into the middle of your work. Don't pour too quickly or you'll get resin that runs up onto the sides of the riverbed and then will pull away later and it'll give your water an unnatural look because it won't be flat. Once you've got the resin poured as a start into the middle of the river, take uh, an artist paintbrush and just push the resin to the edges. Well, our river is almost done. The last thing we need to do is add the ripply waves to give our river that realistic look. For this part, I'm going to use another product from Woodland Scenics. It's called Water Effects. Water Effects looks like a white paste. Actually, it, it looks like a very thick white glue. And it'll stay white until it dries. It'll dry perfectly clear. I'm just using an ordinary artist paintbrush and I'm taking some of the water effects paste out of the bottle and dabbing it around, just pushing it up and down to make little, little wavy tops. As this dries, they're going to sink down and uh, smooth out some, but the final result will make it look like natural waves on our river. If you want taller waves, say like on a lake, you can add multiple layers of the water effects material building up each layer of waves as you go. And there we go.
It is certainly one of the most beautiful railways you will ever have the chance to see. The White Pass and Yukon Route. It's easy to see why they call it the scenic railway of the world. It runs from Skagway, Alaska, 110 miles to Whitehorse in the Yukon. Originally built in 1898, the WP and YR had a very simple mission. The Klondike Gold Rush was on, and Skagway was the gateway to the gold fields. The new railway would take the fortune hunters to their destinations and in search of their dreams. It would link the Klondike mines to the outside world. It can't be done, said most. Too dangerous, too steep, too many mountains. But one optimistic construction man took over and said, give me enough dynamite and I can build you a road to hell. It took American engineers, Canadian contractors, and British financing, but the job did get done. Tens of thousands of men took part in the construction. Dozens of them died. Today, those rushing to Skagway are searching not for gold, but golden memories as they ride 40 miles on one of the steepest narrow-gauge railways in the world. Well, the tracks are only three feet apart, and that's compared to a standard gauge where the tracks are four feet, eight and a half inches apart. Um, back during the, in the rush of the gold rush and in, in when they were trying to build the railroad in record time, um, building the narrow gauge meant that they only had to blast for a 10-foot roadbed and as they were blasting pretty much out of solid granite mountains, that saved a lot of cost and a lot of time. And also, narrow gauge can make sharper curves and also climb a steeper grade. The White Pass Railroad was designated in 1992 an international historic civil engineering landmark. The, both the American and the Canadian Society of Engineers nominated the White Pass Railroad because of its extreme engineering conditions that it was built under. Um, there's only 22 other designated sites in the entire world, the Eiffel Tower, Statue of Liberty, and the Panama Canal. And the White Pass and Yukon Railroad is one of those. The 20-mile-long, three-hour excursion ride in vintage rail cars takes you along the original trail the miners took in 1898. The scenery is spectacular. Breathtaking is an understatement. Right up to the summit today, we're going to see um, cross right over waterfalls and go over wooden trestles that are 250 feet above the floor of the gulch. We'll go through two tunnels and we'll have viewpoints looking all the way back down into the Lynn Canal, which is actually the longest and deepest fjord in North America. And Skagway is located right at the tip of that. Ride the train for a few hours and you will have stories to tell. Ride the train for a lifetime and you are one story after another. I could certainly tell you about one experience. Uh, it happened on June the 24th, 1965. I was coming down the hill with two diesels and 18 cars. There was uh, passengers on the rear of the train, about 150 of them. I come around the curve up here just above eight mile and the track was gone. And uh, the engines went down crashed into a rock wall and I tumbled down the mountainside. And I'm here to tell about it. <laughs> Tiny Skagway, population about 800, gets nearly one half million visitors a year. All of Skagway is really exciting. The whole downtown, all seven blocks long, is the Klondike Gold Rush National Historic Park. It's all wooden sidewalks and, and the streetscape is about 1910. Old false front saloons and um, old time, the first three-story wooden hotel in Alaska is there. And uh, the Park Service um, was de dedicated the city of Skagway uh, National Historic Park in 1976, and they've refurbished half of the buildings, and private citizens have refurbished the other half. And so you almost feel like you're walking into a movie set right from 1898. So it's pretty exciting. Skagway really is a proud town. Proud of an historic railway. Proud that it's ready for the 100-year anniversary of this narrow-gauge masterpiece. Proud that it is home to this rare spectacle of mountain railroading.
you get ready to build a railroad, you have to ask a question. Shall I design the railroad myself or shall I have it professionally designed? And the big issue for me has always been, who am I going to show it to? And if I'm going to show it to my friends, I only had one option, and that was to have it professionally designed. I've built several railroads on my own. I know what my capabilities aren't. And I felt that uh, at this stage of my life, I think I'd rather have it done professionally. And I wanted to have my railroad done as close to museum scale and style as I could, and as a result, relied upon professionals. I had a choice in the railroad, and I either could do it uh, in an average style or in the best. And at my uh, stage in my life, everything that I've tried to achieve over my lifetime has been of the highest quality, both in our own construction business and in my hobbies. And this shouldn't be any different. So uh, we decided that if a museum standard was to be what we wanted to achieve, then we wanted to also find the very best designers, the very best antiquers and the very best quality equipment in which to, uh, to put in the railroad. So it's trouble free for me because I'm not mechanically oriented. Believe it or not, this fantastic layout is tucked away in the loft of a barn on Ron's Meadowbrook Farm in the Napa Valley. If you could bottle this place, it'd be rare and expensive. The discriminating connoisseur would savor every moment. The room itself is finished like an old time passenger car and you're standing inside looking out over the countryside. The extra-large GN3 scale, which is usually used in outdoor garden railroads, makes it look less like a model and more like the real thing. This was an interesting and challenging assignment due to the sheer scale and size of G-scale. Uh, the trains require large radius curves, the rolling stock itself is massive, the figures are big, the structures are enormous. But Ron gave us an enormous building to work in and a wonderful environment to work in. And we had enough space, enough leeway to be colored with our radiuses and be colored with our switches and our track planes to give more depth than actually was really there. And we gave the chance to use scenery and lighting and sound to push the depth farther back. So it's really quite bigger than it appears. We built this with entertainment in mind, essentially because model railways, all model railways, are theater. It's an act, it's a performance. And Ron gave us this wonderful stage to work in. And every time Ron entertains his, his friends and his family, we get a chance to entertain them as well. So we put enough scenery in, enough entertainment, and enough visual interest to make a new story every time. We're in the wine country. We're in the wine business. Uh, we produce wine to give to all of our friends and relatives. And we have uh, four to 600 cases of wine that uh, we need to produce every couple of years. And rather than putting it in a public warehouse, we made the decision to design the refrigerators in the, uh, the carriage house, which is where the train room is. And if you'll look carefully below the railroad layout, you'll see cabinets. And all of those cabinets are specially designed refrigerator units that chill the wine, keep it cool, keep it at the right temperature, and we can store up to 600 cases of wine underneath the train, and that's the rationale for the trains. Figures, vehicles, and other details are the final touches of a layout, and they're often they're the things that really bring a layout to life. Um, and just like any other step in a, the layout building process, careful planning really goes a long way. And three things that you always want to remember, your setting, you want to remember what era you're in, and you want to remember the season. For example, on our Black River Junction layout, we're dealing with mid-1950s, uh, a junction point of the New York Central and the Baltimore and Ohio, and it's, it's probably springtime or summertime. So you want to take all those things into consideration, and also you want to make sure that you populate each different section of your layout. Don't leave anything too barren. You don't want to overdo it, but then again, you, know, you don't want to have a, a big empty hole. And the other thing is now it's real easy to have different scenes specifically themed for things like industrial sections or passenger depots or just city scenes, uh, the, the manufacturers really make it easy, so you don't just have to have a bunch of people standing around. Um, in fact, there are some manufacturers who even make things like vehicle and figure sets, so you basically have a mini, mini scene all ready to go. You have your, your policeman giving a gentleman a ticket, you have folks here, either they're getting ready to go on a family vacation, or maybe they're just returning from a trip. 
So that's the main thing is you want to populate your layout. Um, we have newsstand scenes. We're even going to later on, we'll take advantage of uh, a river detail on our layout and we'll have a fishing scene. And you really want to tell a mini story. And with vehicles, one thing to remember too about your era is even though we're dealing with the mid-1950s, not everybody drove a new car in 1955. So we have a mixture of vehicles from the late 40s, some even a little bit earlier, you know, moving forward to the, the 1950s. And also, another tip with cars, and nowadays, again, manufacturers make it easy, is when we're going to be laying things out on our roadway, you'll see we have vehicles with drivers for on the road. We also have some empty vehicles that we can put in parking lots and on the curbside and things like that. Um, another thing that we particularly lucked out on is we actually have a Baltimore and Ohio delivery van that we'll be able to use in a, at the transfer station on our layout. In addition to ready-built figures and ready-painted vehicles, there's also some simple kits that you can buy, um, simple wooden kits of things like grade crossings, uh, small structures, line side details, or a billboard kit like I have here. Um, these are laser cut kits uh, that go together very easily and they often include uh, not only period styling but different period advertisements. The night trains are running. It's a special thing to see here at the Twin City Model Railroad Museum in St. Paul, Minnesota, where trains run for the public six days a week. We're normally open during the day, and uh, these trains are really detailed inside, and they're also lit. And uh, during the day, you can't appreciate that, but we, we were uh, doing some things, and it just ended up that the lights were down, and we realized this turns into a whole different situation, you know. And of course, at that time, there was very few lights in buildings. But uh, as the excitement built, people were busy running around here putting lights in everything that didn't move fast. The night trains only run a few months of the year, but the museum is open year round. These O scale trains run along eight miles of track. Two lines are for passenger lines, two for freight. Each line is two scale miles long. The museum is what used to be the St. Paul Craftsman Hobby Club. The uh, club officially formed as a craftsman club in an abandoned storefront in uh, 1934 on Grand Avenue. And uh, they modeled anything, they even uh, little gas race cars and what have you. And then in 1939, the interest had strongly moved to railroading and the uh, uh, Carl M. Gray from the Omaha Railroad uh, asked if we wanted to build a display railroad down at the St. Paul Union Depot, which we did. Uh, it took about a year to get open to the public, and so we operated down there for 40 years, and it, what they asked that we would have a railroad that would operate for the public. And uh, I think what caught on was the fact, the amount of enjoyment you get out of building something and then sharing it. There's some beautiful railroads in basements but nobody gets to see it. It's like artwork that never gets to be, you know, viewed or something, and, and it's a shame. And uh, over the years, we've attracted some very good craftsmen at recreating this stuff. The recreations can be startling. Look around this layout, and you start to see things that look familiar. Actually, more than just familiar, they're so real, it's almost scary. Well, the magic. Let's start by that steel bridge out front where Marv Quinn, one of our retirees, spent 23 months cutting and forming over 3,100 pieces of cold rolled steel and then soldering them together to make those two beautiful spans. And they're so accurate that you have a fixed foot over here and then an expansion and contraction foot over here. It's terrific. Things like that, they just thrill the daylights out of me. Volunteers like Ray Norton are the heart of this special place. At a time when some are retiring and heading to Florida for the sun, the old guys here in the north are basking in the glow of train lights. I started in 1984 here. Yeah. I needed a hobby. I don't have enough of them. 
So I had to join the Twin City Model Railroad Club to do a little of this cosmetic railing work. An old retired carpenter, you know. Well, he so. called it a carpenter, but I tell you, <laughs> if you look closely, he's more like a cabinet maker <laughs> because the work he does, it's just beautiful. For instance, the edging around here and the cabinet up front, our display cabinets, they're all good. I mean... Uh, well, I tell you, Mr. Norton, I think the one thing I am proud of is, is Jim Hill's Stone Arch Bridge. Yes, indeed. And uh, the studying I had to do to build that was just He's fantastic. He's got over 2,500 pieces of wood in that thing, <laughs> and the paint job's enough to drive him squirrelier than usual. <laughs> the layout depicts the Minneapolis milling district as it looked from 1935 to 1955, a transition era, a time when steam and diesel engines worked side by side. Here you'll find an ever-changing display of impressive trains, including one Hiawatha that holds a solid place in Ray Norton's heart. You see this space back here? In 1940, I wanted to go from Milwaukee to Chicago rather rapidly. My cousin and I, we'd been down to the NMRA, the National Model Railroad Association Convention, and we wanted to go down see his dad at Chicago, so we were hoboing. And as they pulled out of the station, they went across a grade crossing. We ducked under the gate and got on. And I clocked miles as rapidly as 34 seconds. That meant that he was running 106 miles an hour. You see, the driving wheels on that engine were seven feet in diameter and they didn't have to turn over too often to cover a mile. So uh, <laughs> then in order to miss any reception committee they may have had, when they got down to about 20 miles an hour, Jack and I dropped off. Oh, but it was beautiful, and it's something I haven't forgotten. Now that the layout is done, it's here for you to visit. But don't think just because it's done, you're always going to see the same old stuff. Well. The first thing is, you mentioned the word done, and in model railroading, there just ain't no such thing. That's, you understand, because they can do a beautiful job on it, they'll just get on another beautiful job and add it, or they will make a change. But uh, it's never done. Okay, so done was a poor choice of words. There's always something different here. Anything that makes it into the layout is thoroughly researched to make sure it's just right. Sometimes the fantasy of it all impresses more than just your sense of sight and sound. A little boy come in, I had a box that I was standing on. He just climbed right up there in front of the depot, or in front of the uh, White Castle. And uh, I asked him if he could see the guy standing inside. He said, yeah, I, I could see him. I said, can you see his hamburger? And he said, yes, I can. I said, can you smell it? And he said, oh, yeah, you know. So we have a lot of believers that come down here. We, we really haven't mastered the smell of a White Castle, although it does linger. As long as the love for model trains lives, you'll find guys like these keeping them going. And while they might argue over what's better, steam or diesel, you just know they're having a grand time. Every once in a while we soften up just for the general public, but other than that, why we are our old natural selves. We get in each other's hair as often as we can. And we both and have hair yet. <laughs> yes, it's thin, but it's there. <laughs> the Twin Cities Model Railroad Museum brings in visitors from all over, folks for whom a day at the rails is a happy one. You can't beat it, because it's a railroad that runs well, it looks good, and it, the models are really quite accurate. So for one who loves model railroading, what more could I ask? Before we go any further on our project railroad, we need to take and put in our roads. We're going to use a material by Bush. This is actually a foam rubber material that's got a, an adhesive back to it and it's pretty much peel and stick. And you can curve it a little bit too, but we're also going to have to do some cutting as well. 
One of the first steps after we've determined where our roads are going to go would be to take and put in our grade crossings. I took and built up the approaches for the grade crossings last night using some cork roadbed to build up the road as it approaches the track and then I filled in the area with sculpt -a mold to give it sort of a smooth transition. We're going to need to sand that out before we can lay the road on it and we'll want to paint it too. Where the road crosses the railroad grade, it's called a grade crossing and we're going to use these Blair Line pre-cut wood pieces. I stained them already using a black paint mixed in rubbing alcohol to soak into the wood, but we'll glue them in between the rails and the track. Now that I've got my grade crossings in place, the next step is to actually mark where the road is going to go so we can remove the existing scenery material. The road material itself is just over three inches wide, so I'm using this strip as a sample to decide where the road's going to go. I'm going to mark its location using a black marker. like that. We'll go ahead and mark the rest of the road and get started. For the road to lay down smooth, I need to take and make sure that the surface is pretty flat. So the sculpt -a mold is kind of bumpy and I'm sanding it with one of my coarse grit sanding blocks. You can see this process generates a lot of dust, so it's good to do it early on before you have a lot of finished scenery down. It makes it easier to clean up with the shop back later. Now that David's gone ahead and marked the outlines of the road, I'm going to go ahead and spray inside the marks with 70% isopropyl alcohol. I'm going to let this soak in for a couple minutes, and then I'll come back with the putty knife and we'll start scraping the ground foam off of the areas where our road will be. And as you can see, this comes up very easily in one pass, and it's pretty much all removed. And it leaves a nice, clean surface for the road material. This grade crossing here does not approach the tracks at a 90-degree angle, so we had to cut the grade crossing at a 45-degree angle. David's lines are still faintly visible under the latex paint, so I just went ahead and I carried that line through the grade crossing. Then, using my miter box and a hobby saw, I went ahead and just cut the grade crossings. You'll notice that some of the, the uh, edge here is still raw, but we can go back and we can stain that later with a wash of black paint. Now that Cody's got the grade crossings in and the paint on our approaches is dry, we can lay the road. I'm going to take and start by peeling back a little bit of the road material. And I'll start in this corner here, uh, flush up against the grade crossing, and work my way over to the other road. So here we go. Beginning to lay the road, you want to just tack it, because you might have to come back and pick it up to pull it, get it to follow where you want it to go. The foam material is very, very thin, and so it will show any leftover clumps of things that you may have left behind when you were vacuuming your layout. So be sure that the surface you're working on is clean before you start the process. Now I'm slowly pulling back the paper with this finger here while I'm using my other finger to just guide where the road goes as I angle it towards the other grade crossing where we'll connect. Now that we've got the road tacked in place, I need to roll it to get the adhesive to stick. I'm using a wallpaper roller. You can pick this up at any hardware store. It just has a round wood head. And I'm going to take and use it to press the road in along the path that we've just laid it before. And there we go. We're going to come back and add shoulders and things to this road later, but first I want to take and get some more road sections in to connect with it. At this location, our curve for the road is going to be much too tight for uh, us to be able to bend the road material. So what I'll have to do is take and mark it and cut it, and then we'll be able to continue on with a straight road section off of the curve. Mark the road with my pen. Okay. 
can now add a straight section right off of this curve and keep going this way. Now that we've installed the roads, it's time to add the scenery around them. What we're going to do is use some ballast to create a gravel shoulder for the road, and then we'll fill in the rest of the ground foam scenery to blend it in with our scenery layer on the rest of the layout. To do that, we'll start with our friend Elmer's glue. Take and start by running a bead or two of white glue along where I'm going to create the first shoulder. The Elmer's glue is a starting point because it will give a, t a tack to the scenery materials that I put down first. But then we'll come in and fill in with scenery cement later to make it all stay firm. I'll wet my paintbrush to get the glue to spread a little better. Now you want to be very careful here because you don't want to take and get the glue on the road itself because we don't want our gravel to stick to the road surface. We just want the shoulder to run next to the road. The next part will be to put the ballast along the roadside. I have the ballast put into a styrofoam cup here to make it easy to work with. And I just take a plastic spoon and I'll just gently tap it along the edge. You don't want the shoulder to be too large, but big enough for motorists to pull over if they have a flat tire or just get tired driving home. With that in place, next I'll sprinkle in my ground foam. Start with the weed layer first, which is the thicker or coarser ground foam. And since this part of the railroad here is just going to be open space, I'm going to take and add some ground foam to that area too. We'll just finish the scenery in this location all at the same time. Our coarse weeds. We'll come in with some lighter coarse weeds next. I'm just taking pinches of the material, my fingers, and then rub it, rubbing my fingers with the ground foam together to get it to fall out in sort of a random pattern. All right, and the last layer of ground foam is our fine ground turf. This is a close match for what's on the scenery mat that we put down on the layout earlier. Now, where we have this place here, where the road comes up next to the track, we need to take and fill in the ballast, because you can see that we've obscured a lot of the ballast with our ground foam and our shoulder for the road. So I'm going to use some Cotto ballast that matches the ballast on the plastic track here in order to take and fill that in and make it look more realistic. Again, using a spoon with just a little bit of ballast on it, I'll come along and just gently tap the ballast into place. to make it look like the railroad intended the road to cross here in the first place. I'll also fill in along the rest of the track here too. Okay, now before we can glue this down, we need to take and vacuum up all this loose ballast that's on our road surface so it doesn't accidentally get stuck there with the glue. Now, before applying the scenery cement, I need to wet the area and I'm going to use my water and alcohol mix. This time, because I'm working in a small area, I don't want to use the misting bottle because it will get everything wet. And I want just this area to be wet so I can do other things in other parts of the layout. So I'm using an eyedropper. And I'll just very carefully drop the water and alcohol mix onto the scenery. And capillary action will take and pull it in through all of the ballast and the ground foam. I'm using this as a wetting agent so that when I put down the scenery cement, the scenery cement just moves in between all of the little granules and ground foam pieces and doesn't bead up and dislocate them. With the scenery layer wet, now I can take and add the scenery cement. Again, using an eyedropper, and this time my scenery cement bottle. Come along and very carefully place the glue into the scenery itself. Just like with the water, I'm allowing capillary action to suck the scenery cement up into the areas where I have ballast or small piles of ground foam. 
we've finished the shoulder along that piece of the road, and now I can move on to the next. The sound and the sight of steam in the south goes a long way back in history. It's something the folks here at the Tennessee Valley Railroad want you to think about and feel when you come here. We try to keep everything as, as authentic as possible. Um, the, the, uh, the crew members dress appropriately and, and hopefully um, responding to the passengers the way that, that the passengers could have expected to be in, in the, around the turn of the century, for instance. We have rolling stock from what we call the golden age of railroading from 1910 to 1950 or so. And uh, we do have a mixture of coaches on our trains usually, the earlier types, the, the heavyweight, adjustable window style built in the 1915 to 1925 period. And then also the new, uh, we call them modern coaches built in the 1940s and 1950s. And those would be the lighter weight coaches um, with air conditioning and so forth. If you think about it, the sound of the whistle and the steam blasting into the sky is a kind of air conditioning. It gives this place the air of being locked in another time. One where gazing out at the south through train windows was something new, not nostalgia. Well, we are trying to preserve a little piece of history um, and, and running the, uh, the trains from that period, of course, is part of that. This is what people would have, uh, they would have experienced when they rode the train uh, back in the days when you didn't have automobile travel. Uh, people didn't have a car in their parking in their garage or, you know, out in their driveway. They didn't just run out, jump in the car and take off. Um, they were more accustomed to a scheduled environment. Um, of course, they would usually ride their horse or their horse and carriage to the depot and then catch the, the train to another city for shopping or for visiting, for whatever purpose. But that was the lifestyle, and, and that's what we're trying to portray. It's a pretty ride through lovely country. And while right here the train isn't really going anywhere, the turntable is a favorite destination in itself. As always, the stars of the show are the steam engines. Just like people, each has its own story. Well, locomotive uh, number 610 is kind of unique. It's the last locomotive built by a major builder for domestic use here in the United States, built by the Baldwin Lima Hamilton Corporation uh, after the merger. It was built in 1952, actually two years after the uh, plant closed down. Uh, it was built for the U.S. Army Corps of Transportation. They use it for training purposes at their facility in Fort Eustis, Virginia. Uh, it was brought here to the Tennessee Valley Railroad in 1990 and restored back to operation. And we've been running it now for about 10 years. It's an excellent performer, with proper maintenance, of course. Proper maintenance is something they're proud of here, whether it's restoring an old loco or keeping up gems like this old tunnel that was hand dug before the Civil War. Attention to detail and authenticity of experience keep visitors climbing aboard year after year. We've reached the end of the line for this edition. We hope you've enjoyed the ride. We'll have more layouts, prototypes, and how-to tips next time, and more fun with the world's greatest hobby in the Dream, Plan, Build video series. Welcome to the Dream Plan Build video series. In this collection, you'll see amazing layouts of fellow modelers, some of the most interesting trains and railroads around, and plenty of tips and techniques to make your time at the workbench and at the throttle more productive and a lot more fun. We'll travel across America in search of layouts we all dream of operating and get inside the heads of their builders as they describe how they designed and built their prized railroads. Plus, whether you're running a 4x8 or a 40x80 operation, you'll discover tips and techniques to make your rolling stock run smoother and look more realistic.